stage, Bree Damadia and Todd Stinchfield. Bree, Todd, welcome to Imagine Aviation. Thanks, Steve. Happy to be here. Thanks, Steve. For the first six or seven years, uh, before before Bree and Todd share the presentations, I want to give you a little, little bit of background and share a new approach that we're exploring in CAS. For the first six or seven years of its existence, CAS has had tremendous success across the four NASA aeronautic centers and rapidly assessing and technical feasibility of novel concepts to determine whether additional investment is warranted. Over the past years, CAS has reimagined the way we explore our work. While we continue to leverage our success in exploring technical feasibility of concepts, we're also now intentionally exploring the desirability and viability of any given problem space. Now, in order to do so, we've begun operating and opening up the aperture on how we explore the needs of the greater ecosystem in something we call mapping. We use this process of exploration within the, and outside of NASA to identify larger areas of focus of need within civil aviation. Now, once those focus areas are identified, we dig down into a series of synthesis events designed to really identify the problem areas that we want to explore. Now, I'm sure that some of you are familiar with that famous Einstein quote, which by the way, I don't think actually was said by Einstein, but everybody attributed it to him. And that is, if I had an hour to solve something, I would spend 55 minutes defining the problem. While we don't exactly follow that ratio in CAS, the concept is very similar. CAS is committed to intentionally spending time defining the problem space before diving into the exploration of solutions. Jonathan, if you could go to the next slide, it would really begin to highlight some of this. And this slide summarizes some of the work in our new synthesis process. The overall goal, as you see, is to identify high value opportunities that live in the middle of that Venn diagram between desirability, viability, and technical feasibility. Now we do this by calling together cross-disciplinary experts across the four NASA Aero Centers, as well as those external to NASA where appropriate. You heard John and Ka uh, Catherine talk this morning about bringing in diversity of perspectives, diversity of experiences to get that innovative approach. That's what we're trying to do here. Last fall, we pulled together what we call our new approach of mapping and synthesis and entitled it the Wicked Works. And so you hear the term and you see on the screen cast wicked words. Well, last fall, we facilitated one of those synthesis sessions on the problem space of energy for AAM at scale. Out of that exercise, seven opportunity concepts came forward from our wonderful group of experts on the team. Today, we wanted to take a few minutes to show you two of those opportunity concepts that we're now beginning to enter into discussions with to see if they're worthy of further exploration. So I now want to turn over the microphone to Bree Damadia to share one of those opportunity concepts with us. Bree, go ahead and take it away, and Jonathan, feel free. There you go. Thank you. Thanks so much, Steve. And hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us. Today, I will talk to you a little bit about what came out of the synthesis activity that Steve mentioned. Our concept is called Airports and Aircraft as Energy Nodes. Next slide, please. So when we think about the growing landscape of what will be advanced air mobility over the next 5, 10, 20 years, the vehicles that we're going to try to implement are going to place a novel demand on our electrical grid because they're going to need to charge uh, and they're going to need to do that at any time of the day. At some point in the day, probably we're going to have several peak times where a lot of folks are going to want to use these kinds of vehicles. Then we, we have a, a supply and demand mismatch, which is going to destabilize the grid or potentially destabilize the grid. We don't want to cause brownouts, but that's a potential impact to introducing these technologies widespread across the country. We also have airports that already take up valuable land space, but we'll also need to introduce new concepts of vertiports that will take up additional land space. On top of that, we have EVs, whether that be ground electrical vehicles or if we have aircraft that have, are now becoming electric, that spend a significant amount of time just sitting idle on the ground. They're not serving any purpose. They're not doing anything for anybody. So this is how we traditionally think about how we use airports and, and aircraft at airports. So if we think about things a little bit differently and we spin this story into how airports and aircraft can have more of a symbiotic relationship, we start to ask ourselves questions like, what if the airport 
was powered by the aircraft itself? Or what if the aircraft was powered by an electric car that was sitting nearby or by your footsteps as you walk around on the sidewalk or potentially if the aircraft is landing on a runway and we can absorb that energy? Different ways to think about how we do things now. So the potential impact for completely changing the way that we do things, we would have an improved reliability of the broader electrical grid. So if we're trying to avoid brownouts or in the, the instance of blackouts where there's an emergency and now we can actually provide power from the airport or from the aircraft in, in emergency situations, we'll be able to deliver power when and where we need it at the airport itself or the aircraft itself versus how we do things now where power has to be transmitted across long distances just to get where you need it. We're also introducing or potentially introducing green and renewable energy sources. So now we're talking more grid cleanliness, which has been a big, big talk across the country for the past few years. Faster expansion of AAM concepts, since we'll be able to have a bit more flexibility with how things are implemented and multifunctional use of existing infrastructure and vehicles that we already have. Next slide, please. When we were thinking about how this could be implemented, we came up with a few different concepts, talking about how to implement more renewable power and energy storage directly integrated into infrastructure. So that would be airports um, and, and the immediate area surrounding the airport. How to introduce multifunctional components as building and vehicle infrastructure directly into the building, directly into the aircraft how to implement vehicle to grid concepts where we are doing kind of dual use, where now we've got vehicles that are sitting around that would otherwise be doing nothing while you are off on your electric aircraft ride, but your vehicle is parked in a nearby parking lot and more out there concepts like airborne energy generation. So we do that by leveraging things that we already have or things that we already need. So some of the things listed here are ways that we came up with for potential opportunity areas that we could look into for how to address some of the problems that we're talking about when it comes to the energy that we're going to need at the scale that we're going to need it for electric aircraft. Airport structure integration. We're not talking just strictly putting a solar panel on a roof. We're talking about integrating that solar panel actually into the structure of the building or energy harvesting sidewalks and runways talking about using aircraft for in-flight energy gen generation and power beaming down to the ground and vice versa. A vehicle to grid system where we have a power share between the electric vehicles that are sitting idle in parking lots and the aircraft or the airport. How to do smart source select so that we can determine when it's best to use power from the grid versus power from a locally stored area or on-demand generation from the aircraft. How do we best integrate multifunctional components? And I realize multifunctional might sound like a buzzword, but here we're trying to make the best use out of what we already have. And we already have airport buildings and we already need the aircraft. So why not use them to the best of our abilities? We can also, with excess energy that might be generated at certain times at the airport, provide hydrogen generation, store that, use it on site or off site, find ways to do adaptive charging for aircraft so the aircraft knows when it could scale back on, on charging and when it could ramp up, similar to how some of our cell phones do now. And some of the, the more interesting concepts like how do we use parked aircraft as windmills or use solar generation on those aircraft or how to implement airborne wind energy vehicles and lighter than air craft with solar panels. So those are just some of the concepts that we discussed when we were talking about uh, how to implement energy nodes with our airports and aircraft. So with that, thank you so much. And I'll pass the ball over to Todd, Todd Stinchfield to talk about energy augmentation for advanced air mobility. All right, thanks, Bree. And good morning, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Todd Stinchfield uh, from Ames Research Center, and I'm leading a team that is exploring the opportunities of augmenting energy for advanced air mobility or AAM vehicles. Next slide, please. You know, in the team's initial assessment of the overall topic of energy for AAM at scale, uh, we discovered some potential issues with electric powered AAM vehicles. So as we make this transition to electric powered air vehicles, the AAM market will be limited by the power and capacity of vehicle batteries. By phase of flight, takeoff, landing and holding operations are the highest energy consumers of any flight profile. 
These phases of flight combined with the required FAA energy reserves are expected to consume about 40% of the total available battery power. Additionally, power consumed during holding operations and landings can be unpredictable due to the discharge properties of the batteries. And what I mean by this is specifically, uh, batteries at lower energy states consume more energy for a similar task conducted at full power. Therefore, landings in very low energy states appear to be a dangerous corner of the flight envelope. Next slide. So these issues lead us to our opportunity, which is to create a capability for augmenting AAM vehicles with external energy from the vertiport. By enabling this capability, we can provide additional power for flight, as well as establish a potential backup system to power AAM vehicles during emergencies, thereby enhancing the overall AAM safety. The impacts for AAM augmentation are potentially far reaching. An energy augmentation system could completely alter the design of AAM vehicles. With additional power available to the vehicle, AAM designers could reduce weight, size, and cost. So these changes alone could help accelerate the AAM public adoption timeline. On the flip side, if vehicle manufacturers maintain their current designs, vehicles with energy augmentation would have greater range or duration. This capability would allow uh, operations into new markets that could not previously have been served. Energy augmentation also opens up the possibility for charging vehicles prior to landing. This feature would reduce required ground times for charging and increase the throughput at vertiports. So one additional feature that energy augmentation enables is longer duration holding. When vertiports are busy and all the landing pads are occupied, low energy vehicles will have no option but to divert. But at vertiports that are equipped with energy augmentation, AAM vehicles could hold longer and be charged while they wait for an open landing pad. So this feature better serves the needs of passengers and would encourage adoption of the service by reducing potentially bad AAM experiences. So as an example of what our team envisions, the picture on the right here is a notional concept of employing wireless power transfer uh, to power and or charge AAM vehicles during flight. However, power beaming is only one of the potential methods that we're exploring. Next slide. So the other concepts that we're looking into include physical connections like wires, swappable batteries, and airborne recharging platforms. The, the ultimate goal is to find the best augmentation method and then explore any barriers that preclude its development. And that's just not on the technical feasible side, but also desirability and viability, as Steve mentioned earlier. Once these barriers are well understood, our team will develop potential solution vectors to overcome them. So the overall goal of this whole process is to remove the barriers that prevent or slow the development of concepts and technologies which support the expansion of AM operations. And with that, I will uh, throw it back to Steve for any questions for the group. Steve? Thanks, Todd. Thanks, Bree. Appreciate it. Boy, these really early nascent concepts that we're discussing here really do challenge the traditional paradigms, if you will, on how to approach uh, the energy needs for AM. Uh, it, it can't help but think it embraces that area of discomfort, asking the what if um, that, that Catherine was almost alluding to this morning. I, I really do love it. it. It's such an exciting approach. Um, and now in the past, CAS accepted a lot of proposed solutions in areas of need of aviation. We've seen from the success of some of these efforts over the past six, seven years, including Aerobon and Susan, this is a great way to foster innovative solutions for our research staff. Uh, and solutions are what we're about. But this new approach, which also focuses on the identification and focuses on the problem space, it, it seems to me that we can really open up even more doors that are possible to solution paths. It, it's all, for example, this we spent five or six weeks on this in the fall, and we had seven opportunity concepts come out of it from this wonderful group of people. And each of those can almost like dendrite out into multiple solution approaches if you wanted to. So, uh, Bree, let me start with you. As a researcher, you've 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 done this for your entire career. You've worked on CAS a few times. We'll talk about that in a minute. But as a researcher, do you do you agree with what I'm saying that, that maybe this problem formulation might open up? more paths for you and your peers to, to propose solutions. I do agree with that, Steve. In the past, you know, you've 
CAS has left the, the opportunity space open for individual researchers to determine what they think is a big problem to solve. And, you know, I, I have a specific area of expertise, and I, so I may be biased and really think that what I want to do is something that's really going to be impactful. So I think it's beneficial in that sense where ahead of time we get folks together from different areas and multidisciplinary expertise to come together and agree that, yes, this is a problem and we do think somebody should solve it. Not to say that those research areas don't still have applicability because they do, but I think it helps when you go in knowing that there's a big problem that needs to be solved and you can find ways to solve it. That, that's great. T Todd, you're newer to the agency, but you've obviously been in, uh, around this for a long time in your career. But what's been your experience with this, this approach we've tried, this synthesis approach we tried in the fall where uh, we bring in uh, a very diverse group of people to have innovative discussions and challenging each other's uh, to determine if some of these opportunities are even worth funding. So how, what's been your experience is it? Uh, I'd say it's certainly been exciting. I mean, having seen the whole process from uh, the mapping side where, you know, we undercover all the wicked problems to uh, the synthesis teams where we get this multi great multidisciplinary team from all the NASA centers. Um, it's great to see the ideas that, that people are, are willing to pitch. Um, you know, some of the ideas seem crazy at the time, but when we're looking 20 or 30, 30 years out, that, that those are exactly the ideas that we need to consider. Absolutely. Uh, there's there's a question in, in, the, in the chat with we're talking about um, the diverse teams of SMEs. How do they interact with groups outside of NASA for feedback and access to expertise on their own? And, and I'll actually feel this one. Uh, our new process in the Wicked Works, both it, so the mapping does, the mapping component goes out and looks outside. It does look inside as well because there's brilliant work within the agency that we don't uh, overlook. We want to add to that. So we talk to a lot of people. We investigate a lot of areas to explore these, these problem focus areas. But in synthesis, we have we have lots of different modes that this can be implemented in, and a couple of them we've been trying already involves it can involve these very uh, internal ideation sessions. We could bring in other governmental partners. We could invite in uh, other academic institutions through our partners in, in in the university initiatives. But also we have some more events that are more like technical interchange meetings where we bring in other regulatory agencies, where we can bring in other private sector companies. Uh, we've talked to a lot of, in our mapping, we might talk to small manufacturers, we might talk to venture capitalists. So it is really something we're intentionally trying to go forward to expand how we look at things. Now, there's also a, a few questions in, in the chat that are very specific regarding research. So, and this is this is where I, I want to take a step back. This part of, so Arabon, Susan, research that's going on, has been going on for years or starting up in a long-term process. Our Wicked Works approach, this is something we're trying new. So there isn't research in this area yet. We've just identified opportunity concepts. So let me, let me Bree and Todd, either one of you, as these concepts are in place that came out, the next step is, all right, let, let's take a look at these. Are they really worthy of what we want to go forward with? This is where we might bring in others to, to rethink how we would approach this. So uh, Todd, maybe take us a, a step a little bit about some of the things you're thinking through now to determine if this is worthy of, of real research and dedicated time. Yeah, so the first step for our team is, uh, you know, scope definition. There, there's a lot of ways you can augment uh, energy, whether it's power beaming or, you know, we're talking about cables or, or uh, you know, detachable batteries. Um, so... It's very important for us to reach out and get people with expertise in those areas, people that have AM backgrounds, people that have um, battery backgrounds, power system backgrounds, so we can really kind of understand what, what is in the realm of the possible um, within the next 20 or 30 years. And then, and then uh, you know, potentially those people will uh, take our ideas and take them a step further or come up with a few of their own. Uh, that's a great approach. And there, there's a question in the chat as well is pretty related to this. And, and Bria, I'll throw it to you to take a first stab at, but any of us could answer is um, some of these outputs that come out of these opportunity concepts and we start digging at them. If, if we start chewing on something that seems pretty tasty, how, how can these efforts become actionable within NASA Aeronautics? 
I think that we have a lot of opportunities and a lot of ways to broaden the reach of where these concepts go. And one of the ones that I'm most excited about is throwing it out to some of the newer people in the workforce and getting getting ideas from them, from folks who haven't maybe been jaded by being told no one too many times, or they aren't 100% sure whether something will work, but they're willing to, to throw it out there. And I think what CAS allows is that question where you, you think, it's cool, sure, but can it be done? And it, the answer doesn't have to immediately be, yes, it can. It can be, let's find out. And just finding people that you can bring together that are willing to try and fail in case it turns out that it, it doesn't work out. So I think you know you can really get it out to, to some of those folks that are really excited about doing things and, and have even just small little bits of projects going on that may turn into something bigger over time. Yeah, I, I love that it that it, it provides those opportunities for 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 a lot of different variety of our workforce. Early career is absolutely one of them, and and that's good. Uh, t- t- Todd, you're newer to the agency, but that doesn't always correlate with early career. Uh, I'm not I'm not here to call you out on your age. I think we're similar, but yeah, you've been experienced in this and and you've seen this. But you, you're you're newer to the agency when you fr- and one of the first things that we we uh, we sucked you into was some of these cast efforts. And instantly you were introduced to people from the four different aero centers, different backgrounds, different technology expertise. What was that like to to have an opportunity to really just to ex- expand expand your thinking with such a, a wide variety of people? I mean, it's great to be able to discuss new concepts with uh, where everybody in the room is an expert in their field. So you really, you know, can get to what what is the state of the art pretty quickly and understand, you know, what's in the realm of the possible. And and I appreciate, you know, being with NASA for a year and coming to CAS after being a NASA for only a couple months uh, from the Air Force. I like to bring that operational experience of my uh, my time as a as a C-17 pilot in the Air Force and and uh, bring that thought process uh, and matching that up with the technical side as well. Yeah, and and one thing that that I noticed, and either you can comment on this, when when I was part of that first session uh, in the fall that we were alluding to here for Energy for AM is that it's not only uh, the diverse perspectives and the diverse expertise, we have a lot of expertise in this agency and outside that we can bring in, but it is that it's the, it's a different mindset that I've noticed, and so I, I, this my opinion. I want to see if you you two agree with this as well or, or differ. That's fine. Is when you come in, it's you present your ideas, and your ideas and your concepts and your experience might have 20, 30 years behind them. But very, very impressive and valid. But you present these in new areas with others, and someone might challenge you on that and say, "Great, but have you looked at it this way?" And I, the people that were challenge are like, yeah, that's great. So it's an almost like an open mindedness to to share. It's that 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 equation of one plus one equals three. You know, together we're going to come up with something better. I I witnessed that. Did you two feel it as, per, as participants in that event as well? Or I'll start with you. I know I definitely did. And I would add to that that it was really great because not in any session that we had did anyone come up with an idea and someone else came back and said, no, that will not work absolutely not don't even think about it and so there was definitely a willingness to participate more and come up with some of those wacky out of the box ideas because no one was shooting anything down just challenging how you were thinking about it right todd similar question yeah i'd say that happens in synthesis as well as uh i mean that's currently happening uh, in the planning phase of my team right now for energy augmentation uh we were talking about some concepts the other day and one of our new team members said i don't know if this is science or science fiction and i said welcome to CAS." so you know (laughs) those are the things that we're looking at and exploring and and it's it's important to have those discussions and and consider all possibilities oh absolutely uh, and while these are opportunity concepts are very nascent in our thinking and discussions, they they really do still illustrate the new approach in CAS and how we intentionally focus on the problem formulation that lead us to these potential concepts and opportunities. Uh, Bree, this isn't your first runaround with CAS. You, you've been involved in a couple different CAS efforts in the in our original formulation of how we do this. Um, what have you noticed as some of the differences between your past exposure to CAS and this new Wicked Works approach? I think that 
with the new approach, it'll be easier to bring together a team of people across the centers that have multidisciplinary expertise that is also uh, complementary to what is needed for for the project. And that was a little tough to do before, because in a lot of instances on some of the CAST projects that I've worked on, I didn't know folks from the other centers, let alone some of the folks that work in other groups at my own center, because we typically wouldn't have any interaction. So I think this process makes it a bit easier to help identify the gaps that you might have and the folks that can fill them. Oh, that, that's that's really good to hear. And it makes a lot of sense. And it, it, it I think it, it really opens up the opportunities for some really great things and to involve our, our workforce. Uh, last last question for you both, because we're about out of time. Todd, I'll start with you. And um, what would you say to someone if they asked, hey, I've been asked to participate in one of these upcoming CAS events. Should I? And what would I get out of it? I would say absolutely give it a shot and uh, have an open mind about the results and, and the process. And, uh, you know, what you get out of it is, uh, you know, learning about a new topic, which you m might have not previously explored, and also uh, making those other connections at other centers and other disciplines, which, uh, you know, might benefit you later on in, in other projects or, or, you know, within CAS itself. Oh, great. Bree, same question. I would have to say yes, otherwise I would be a hypocrite because I'm now on my fourth cast project that I've had involvement in. So uh, either I'm sadistic and I keep coming back for more or I enjoy the process. And every time I leave one of those projects, I come away with just enough knowledge to be dangerous in an area that is not my area of expertise and and try to forge those relationships. And I really enjoy that. Oh, that is, that is excellent. Uh, we're, we're out of time. I really want to take time to thank Brita Madia. Todd Stinchfield, uh, their their expertise, their openness, and their attitude, and their passion about something like this uh, really test is a testament to, to what we're trying in CAS, a summary of what you heard so far to the day. So thank you both for taking the time to share your work on these exploratory opportunity concepts. Bree, Todd, thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks, Steve. So if you were with us yesterday, 